Hi everyone. Before I begin the video lecture on the film Helen, I want to acknowledge that this is a challenging film to watch. Um, of the films that I have people watch in this class, this is the one that people often tell me was the one that um, triggered for them the most painful experiences um, and often that they felt the need to pause while watching. Um, for so many people, the experience of de depression is personal. Um, it, it, depression is ubiquitous. Um, so most of us have at least some kind of exposure, either in our own personal lives to depression or through our close friends and family. Um, so as you've watched this film, um, I understand that it can have triggering effects. For people, particularly if you have um, experiences with depression yourself, if you've experienced suicidal thoughts, um, if someone you know has had experience with suicidal depression, suicidal thoughts, or even suicidal actions, um, those experiences that you're having, the thoughts that you're having now, are natural and appropriate. If you are feeling um, very triggered, by the film or my discussion of it. I hope that you will reach out um, and remember that you can always call the crisis text line by texting um, 741 741. So the film Helen um, was uh, directed by Sonner Nettelbach, who is a, a German director. Um, according to Jeanette Katsoulis, who was writing a review in the New York Times in 2010, when the film was viewed um, at the Sundance Film Festival, she states that Nettelbach was inspired by the death by suicide of a friend of hers um, from her childhood. Um, and she, Katsoulis goes on to state that the theme film keenly conveys the profound isolation of mental illness and the, the futility of searching for someone or something to blame. And that's one of the reasons that um, I ask students to watch this film, because typically depression and suicide when they're presented in film um, or in television shows is often presented as being due to caused by some kind of traumatic act or the bad behavior of other people um, or the bad behavior of the person him or herself um, and often suicide unfortunately is presented as either practical or a response to being a bad person um, Helen does none of those things Helen gives you a pretty unflinching exposure to what the experience of uh, what's called in, in uh, clinical circles, clinical depression. Um, other names for what Helen experiences that you can find you know, in, in the research literature, severe suicidal depression, um, clinical depression, major depression. All of those are words that are used to describe this experience. Um, also writing in 2010, Marlo Stern, writing for the Manhattan Movie Magazine, interviewed um, Ashley Judd, and Judd stated that within a few minutes of receiving the script and beginning to read it, she identified with the story, um, and in part that's because um, she herself uh, has been treated for severe depression, um, as well as for issues related to trauma and substance abuse. So she was familiar with the experience and the impact of the experience of depression on the people around her. Um, one of the most important things about this film, before we get into the details, is that the, the film does what so many other films which feature characters who are depressed um, and or suicidal which is they, they identify no one to blame. There's only one villain and it's the disease itself. And, and that is a remarkably accurate presentation. Also in Stern's interview, um, 
she's asked about the themes of hospitalization and use of medications. Um, and that's another departure of this film from the typical. Um, most films which involve uh, characters with serious mental illness, such as depression or schizophrenia or bipolar, present you at best a mixed opinion on the usefulness of medication. And most films that involve hospitalization present it either as benignly useless or punitive, um, punishing the person. Um, this film departs from that by giving you um, a fairly accurate uh, and comparatively much more positive uh, presentation of the purpose of hospitals, while simultaneously giving you what families often report is the frustrating reality of hospitalization for people who are um, experiencing mental illness. Um, human beings, uh, even when they are in the grips of a serious mental illness, have rights um, to be in control of aspects of their care. And this film gives you a very accurate uh, depiction of the struggle that families have in terms of trying to keep their family members safe um, and simultaneously the struggle of the people with mental illness face with trying to remain um, in control of their own experiences and to have a say in their own treatment. Now I'm going to begin um, with a, a video uh, that is an interview with Ashley Judd and her co-star Warren Bishnick who talk about the film um, and their experience with it. I'm here with Ashley Judd and Gorn Vishnich from good Helen. Job, good job, good job. Vishnich, Vishnich, that's so hard. You guys tried it home. That was Sundance, it's insane probably. A little bit. I always love coming to Sundance. I think having Helen have its world premiere here it was the perfect venue because people are so passionate about film they're really engaged can you talk about your part and what happens in this film the film establishes that helen and david have made a wonderful world together they appear to be financially secure i have a job about which um i'm crazy and a daughter who has her own gifts and talents but as my grandmother has taught me in my real life we're only as sick as our secrets and helen has a secret that 12 years prior I, as Helen, had an episode of major suicidal depression with a really serious suicide attempt. And I've never, out of my shame, shared that with my husband. And you see at the beginning of the film that I am beginning to inexorably slip into what appears to be another episode. Do you want me to call Dad to come and pick me up? No. Of course not. I'm taking you. How do you want this film to kind of move the needle um, with respect to how people look at depression? Well, I think it is very helpful for folks to understand the disease concept of depression and then it's not something of which to be ashamed and it should be treated much like, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease or cancer is treated. You know, suicide is the leading cause of death of women in a certain age group and it's the third leading cause of death in young people. It's unbelievably prevalent. I mean, it's actually a public health emergency. How was it to make this film? I mean, is it heavy? Was it heavy on the set? What was it like? It was quite heavy. I mean, not so much for me as, as for Ashley, but whatever, what she was doing on a set, it was like, you know, she made my job so easy because I was just there literally to react on what was going on. One of the reasons why I li liked the project so much is this uh, relationship between husband and wife, you know, when he doesn't understand what's going on. Alan is a happy, successful woman. She loves her job. She loves her daughter. Your wife is not unhappy, Mr. Leonard. Your wife is ill. Everyone has a story. And so, as I said, we are only as sick as our secrets, and talking about it is a great way to take a step forward. So that gives you some insight into where Ashley Judd was in her thinking about this film in 2000. 10 after the film was completed. Um, another uh, reviewer, Joseph Smigelski, writing for the Huffington Post in 2010, also interviewed Ashley Judd. And um, in that, he, he notes 
he hopes a lot of people see Helen because he sees it as an important film. Um, despite the fact that it is heavy, um, he feels that the impact of the message will be positive. So the film is, in fact, heavy and sometimes very hard to watch. Um, depression is an ugly disease and one of the, the big positives of the film, despite the fact that it is uh, fairly triggering and difficult to consume, um, it is important to see. In our real lives, if we encounter someone with depression and see what we see on the screen in Helen, what you learn is what to expect and how to be challenged by that and how to know how to respond um, in order to keep people safe. So as Smigalski says, Helen is a movie that's hard to watch, but it's well worth watching for the insights it provides into a serious condition that affects too many people um, around us. Uh, he also notes a statistic, and this statistic should be updated. That's a challenge for you to put you on the table. Um, he was writing in 2010. He notes that um, depressive disorder, major depressive disorder, was the leading cause of disability in the United States for people between the age of 15 and 44. And he cites the statistic that 14.8 million adults, or about 6.7% of the U.S. population, 18 and older, is affected. Now your challenge is to go look up the current statistics um, on depression and related disorders to see their impact in the world around us. <laughs> So I'm going to start our conversation by talking about um, what was going on in Helen's life as the film opens. Um, and you know, your response to this as you watch the film and you do your film reflections um, will be very interesting to me. Her life, um, as you know, Ashley Judd described in the, the video clip that I shared with you, um, and you can find this in, in many movie reviews. Uh, such as Smigelski's that I've quoted from here already, um, her life appears to be pretty great. Um, she's a music teacher, she has a daughter, she has a, a hot Slavic husband, she has this great uh, urban contemporary house. Um, she appears to have great friends who are celebrating her birthday. But right away you can tell that there are some things that just are not working for her. She seems distant. She seems to drift out of the happiness of the party. Um, her behavior is in some ways discordant with the experience of a party that's been thrown in her honor. Um, Smigelski, in his review, describes Helen as a talented pianist um, with a job she loves, teaching music at a university. Um, she has her husband, her teenage daughter, who appear to adore her. Um, but at the birthday party, she's surrounded by people who value her and treasure her, but she can't feel it. And that's really the, the first signal that you get in the film, that um, she is what clinicians call decompensating, which is a fancy word for she's losing the, the compensatory skills meaning adaptive behaviors that keep us in a, a healthy mood state, that keep us able to do the tasks of daily living, such as getting up on time, eating regularly, doing our jobs, um, maintaining our relationships, and so on. So what you see as she decompensates is she's steadily losing those abilities to adapt um, in a healthy way to her life and the needs and demands of her, her family. Now in this video, you're given um, some more information from another perspective. For, the, for a long time in my life, I felt like I've been living two different lives. There's the life that everyone sees, and then 
there's a life that only I see. And in the life that everyone sees, who I am is a friend, a son, a brother, a stand-up comedian, and a teenager. That's the life everyone sees. If you're at so I'm going to pause right there and note, um, and Smigelski in his review notes the same thing. You know, as you're watching Helen during the first part of the film, he states, you see in brutal fashion how step by step uh, her husband and daughter discover how serious her illness is. Um, and then one of Helen's doctors tells David that, you know, when, when David do says that he didn't see it coming, he states that some hide it very well. And that's, that's kind of a, 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 a fact of depression, of depressive illness. And I know this from my own experience, um, having been diagnosed with depression more than 20 years ago, that I was extraordinarily good at pretending it wasn't there. So I would spend the day when I was encountering people passing as a person who wasn't depressed and then would be crushed by it by the time I got home to my apartment. So as the doctor says, some hide it very well um, until they can't, until it's impossible to do so anymore. Friends and family to describe me, that's what they would tell you. And that's a huge part of me. That is who I am. And if you're asking me to describe myself, I'd probably say some of those same things. And I wouldn't be lying, but I wouldn't totally be telling you the truth either. Because the truth is, that's just the life everyone else sees. In the life that only I see, who I am, who I really am, is someone who struggles intensely with depression. I have for the last six years of my life, and I continue to every day. Now, for someone who has never experienced depression or doesn't really know what that means, that might surprise them to hear, because there's a pretty popular misconception that depression is just being sad when something in your life goes wrong when you break up with your girlfriend, when you lose a loved one, when you don't get the job you wanted. But that's sadness, that's a natural thing, that's a natural human emotion. Real depression isn't being sad when something in your life goes wrong. Real depression is being sad when everything in your life is going right. That's real depression and that's what I suffer from. And to be totally honest, that's hard for me to stand up here and say. It's hard for me to talk about. And it seems to be hard for everyone to talk about it, so much so that no one's talking about it. And no one's talking about depression, but we need to be, because right now it's a massive problem. It's a massive problem. But we don't see it on social media, right? We don't see it on Facebook, we don't see it on Twitter, we don't see it on the news, because it's not happy, it's not fun, it's not light. And so because we don't see it, we don't see the severity of it. But the severity of it, the seriousness of it is this. Every 30 seconds, Every 30 seconds, somewhere, someone in the world takes their own life because of depression. And it might be two blocks away, it might be two countries away, it might be two continents away, but it's happening, it's happening every single day. And we have a tendency as a society to look at that and go, so what? So what? We look at that and we go, that's your problem, that's their problem. We say we're sad and we say we're sorry, but we also say, so what? Well, two years ago, two years ago was my problem. Because I sat on the edge of my bed, where I'd sat a million times before, and I was suicidal. I was suicidal. And if you were to look at my life on the surface, you, you wouldn't see a kid who was suicidal. You'd see a kid who was the captain of his basketball team, the drama and theater student of the year, the English student of the year, someone who was consistently on the honor roll and consistently at every party. So you would say I wasn't depressed, you would say I wasn't suicidal, but you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. So I sat there that night beside a bottle of pills with a pen and paper in my hand, and I thought about taking my own life, and I came this close to doing it. I came this close to doing it. And I didn't. So that makes me one of the lucky ones, one of the people who gets to step out on the ledge and look down but not jump. One of the lucky ones who survives. Well, I survived, and that just leaves me with my story. And my story is this. In four simple words, I suffer from depression. I suffer from depression. And for a long time, 
I think I was living two totally different lives where one person was always afraid of the other. I was afraid that people would see me for who I really was, that I wasn't the perfect popular kid in high school everyone thought I was, that beneath my smile there was struggle, and beneath my light there was dark, and beneath my big personality just hid even bigger pain. See, some people might fear girls not liking them back. Some people might fear sharks. Some people might fear death. But for me, for a large part of my life, I feared myself. I feared my truth. I feared my honesty. I feared my vulnerability. And that fear made me feel like I was forced into a corner. I was forced into a corner, and there was only one way out. And so I thought about that way every single day. I thought about it every single day. And if I'm being totally honest standing here, I've thought about it again since, because that's the sickness. That's the struggle. That's depression. And depression isn't chicken pox. You don't beat it once and it's gone forever. It's something you live with. It's something you live in. It's the roommate you can't kick out. It's the voice you can't ignore. It's the feelings you can't seem to escape. And the scariest part is, the scariest part is, is that after a while, you become numb to it. It becomes normal for you. And what you really fear the most isn't the suffering inside of you. It's the stigma inside of others. It's the, it's the shame. It's the embarrassment. It's the disapproving look on a friend's face. It's the, it's the whispers in the hallway that you're weak. It's the comments that you're crazy. That's what, that's what keeps you from getting help. That's what makes you hold it in and hide it. It's the stigma. So you hold it in and you hide it. And you hold it in and you hide it. And even though it's keeping you in bed every day and it's making your life feel empty no matter how much you try and fill it, you hide it because the stigma in our society around depression is very real. Now, again, I'm going to pause there. Um, many students over the years watching Helen have said, why would she not tell her husband what was going on with her? Why is she hiding it? And what the, the speaker on the video is describing is the reason. She has deeply internalized her, the stigma that surrounds her about mental illness and its impact on her capacity as a wife and a mother. She has deeply internalized those societal stigmatizing ideas such that they have become her own. So she sees the lies that depression tells her as truths and they are mirrored in the stigma that comes from the outside world as well. Very real, and if you think that it isn't, ask yourself this. Would you rather make your next Facebook status say you're having a tough time getting out of bed because you hurt your back? Or you're having a tough time getting out of bed every morning because you're depressed? That's the stigma. Because unfortunately, we live in a world where if you break your arm, everyone runs over to sign your cast. But if you tell people you're depressed, everyone runs the other way. That's the stigma. We are so, so, so accepting of any body part breaking down other than our brains. And that's ignorance. That's pure ignorance. And that ignorance has created a world that doesn't understand depression, that doesn't understand mental health. And that's ironic to me because depression is one of the best documented problems we have in the world, yet it was one of the least discussed. We just push it aside and put it in a corner and pretend it's not there and hope it'll fix itself. Well, it won't. It hasn't, and it's not going to because that's wishful thinking. And wishful thinking isn't a game plan, it's procrastination. And we can't procrastinate on something this important. The first step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. Well, we haven't done that. So we can't really expect to find an answer when we're still afraid of the question. And I, I don't know what the solution is. I wish I did, but I don't. But I think, I think it has to start here. It has to start with me, it has to start with you, it has to start with the people who are suffering, the ones who are hidden in the shadows. We need to speak up and shatter the silence. We need to be the ones who are brave for what we believe in because if there's one thing that I've come to realize, if there's one thing that I see as the biggest problem, it's not in building a world where we eliminate the ignorance of others. It's in building a world where we teach the acceptance of ourselves we're okay with who we are because when we get honest, we see that we all struggle and we all suffer, whether it's with this, whether it's with something else. We all know what it is to hurt. We all know what it is to have pain in our heart. We all know how important it is to heal. But right now, depression is society's deep cut that we're content to put a Band-Aid over and pretend it's not there. Well, it is there. It is there. And you know what? It's okay. Depression is okay. If you're going through it, know that you're okay. 
I know that you're sick. You're not weak, and it's an issue, not an identity, because when you get past the fear and the ridicule and the judgment and the stigma of others, you can see depression for what it really is. And that's just a part of life, just a part of life. And as much as I hate, as much as I hate some of the places, some of the parts of my life depression has dragged me down to, in a lot of ways, I'm grateful for it. Because, yeah, it's put me in the valleys, but only to show me there's peaks. And, yeah, it's dragged me through the dark, but only to remind me there is light. My pain, more than anything in 19 years on this planet, has given me perspective. And my hurt, my hurts forced me to have hope. Have hope and to have faith. Faith in myself. Faith in others. Faith that it can get better, that we can change this, that we can speak up and speak out and fight back against ignorance. Fight back against intolerance. And more than anything... Learn to love ourselves. Learn to accept ourselves for who we are, the people we are, not the people the world wants us to be. Because the world I believe in is one where embracing your light doesn't mean ignoring your dark. The world I believe in is one where we're measured by our ability to overcome adversities, not avoid them. The world I believe in is one where I can look someone in the eye and say, I'm going through hell. And they can look back at me and go, me too, and that's okay. And it's okay because depression is okay. We're people. We're people, and we struggle, and we suffer, and we bleed, and we cry. And if you think that true strength means never showing any weakness, then I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. You're wrong because it's the opposite. We're people, and we have problems. We're not perfect, and that's okay. So we need to stop the ignorance, stop the intolerance, Stop the stigma and stop the silence. We need to take away the taboos. Take a look at the truth and start talking. Because the only way we're going to beat a problem that people are battling alone is by standing strong together. By standing strong together. And I believe that we can. I believe that we can. Thank you guys so much. This is a dream come true. Thank you. Thank you. So what Mr. Briel, who, you know, at 19 years of age when he recorded that TED Talk is uh, showing remarkable wisdom and insight into his own illness, um, he, he gives you a pretty uh, clear statement of the situation that he found himself in as a young person feeling uh, the, the, the deeply dangerous side of depression, which is suicidality, and feeling ashamed and feeling like he needed to hide it. And that's an, a message that is echoed in the film. Um, a blog post that I found by John Folk Williams, who is a, a person with depression, who writes a blog called Storied Mind, um, he states when in his review of the film, if you've been struggling with depression, you'll recognize the truth in every scene. A viewing experience I often found hard, but take, take as ultimately healing. If you need to understand more deeply what a friend or loved one is going through, this film will take you inside the illness. Um, he also notes that one of the remarkable things about the film is its rejection of taking a kind of forced drama arc approach to the story, um, creating some kind of uh, cause. Like, the storyteller could have written it with the husband, David, being unfaithful in actuality, not just tempted, but actually being unfaithful before her symptoms start to worsen. Um, instead, what you're given is his life coming unglued, um, his needing solace, his needing some kind of connection when he loses his wife to the disease, uh, at least temporarily. So in instead of having, as Folk Williams notes, a subplot of infidelity, a sadistic mental health the mental hospital staff, some simple uh, triumphant moment of aha insight that helps her recover. None of those lies are told in this film, so he found it to be very authentic. Um, now, this video clip, and I, I probably won't play the entire thing, 
um, because one of you has the disorder card for uh, major depression and another one of you has the disorder card for persistent depression, um, which used to be called dysthymic disorder. But I did want to make sure that in the, the video lecture um, you get some, some basic information about depression. I want so much for simple things, wellness, happiness, family togetherness. I wish I could answer why this is happening. Sometimes I really and truly feel like I'm going crazy. And why, when I am so surrounded with love, do I feel so alone? And right now, no one can say that I haven't tried. I have. I'm scared. If you think about the worst you have ever felt in your life, and imagine feeling that way every day, and not knowing why, then you'll know what depression is. You feel it as anguish in your chest. You feel it in every one of your bones and ligaments. You feel a heaviness and moving. Depression is a perplexing illness that takes many forms. Depression tortures you every day with the idea that you suffer and somehow I ought to be able to do something about it and I can't. Depression is an illness of loneliness and the primary experience is the feeling of being isolated, of being alone, of being cut off from everyone and everything. It can strike early in life or as late as our twilight years. Trauma, loss or neglect can lead to depression in those who are vulnerable. Our therapy becomes the bottle, our therapy become pills, our therapy become crime, violence. Genetics also plays a role. The major risk factor is having a family history of depression. I'm very anxious and very depressed because I don't think I can do this anymore. Treatment is an ongoing process of trial and error. If you can't talk it down, drug it down, shock it down, maybe you have to do something else in a much more bulleted kind of way, if you will. Scientists are hard at work, piecing together a better understanding of the many faces of depression. If someone can get the appropriate treatment and stay with it, the prognosis is actually very, very good. Meanwhile, over 20 million Americans are living with depressive disorders, many of them terrified to step out of the shadows and seek help. So that was the introduction to a PBS program that you can still access from um, I believe from the PBS website. Uh, after I'm done with recording, I will um, see if I can find the, the link again for the entire program if you're interested in watching it. Um, I'm going to pause here and say that this is the end of part one of the video lecture for Helen. When we come back, um, I'll be working more with the questions, the reflection questions that you respond to as you watch the film.